The number of job openings in the U.S. has been hovering between 9 million to 12 million open roles, and these empty desks are dragging down the economy. You're talking about passing up something like a trillion dollars in production every year that these jobs go unfilled. At the same time, there are millions of people who want to come to the U.S. to work. It still is the shining city on the hill for most people in the world. If they're going to immigrate, and we do surveys at Ipsos where I see this, the most popular place for people to immigrate in the world is still the United States. It's clear that the U.S. has a very important pull factor in terms of migration. It's the largest economy in the world. But American immigration policies bar many employers from hiring unskilled migrants, claiming it protects American workers. Joe Biden's five million illegal aliens are on the verge of replacing you replacing your jobs. The public is split evenly on this. 51% of Americans surveyed by the Cato Institute worry immigration could reduce the number of jobs available. Meanwhile, a crisis at the border continues. Illegal immigrants in uh, fiscal 22, there were 2.7 million encounters uh, at the border. It's a sort of bum rush where the people who get to make the choice about who fills this uh, supposed labor vacuum are the people who show up at the border as opposed to the United States Congress and the people who voted for it. The immigration crisis is of historic proportions right now, both in terms of the number of people violating the law and the fact that our legal immigration system is facing backlogs like it's never seen before in the history of the United States. How U.S. immigration policies hurt the economy. The U.S. is running out of workers. It's been this way for a while. And with only 5.8 million unemployed workers and almost 10 million open roles, the math just will not add up. Meanwhile, a large majority of the U.S. population is aging out of the workforce. The effect of a shrinking aging population is a decline in innovation combined with the fact that you're just going to run out of the things that drove economic growth. Just look at the facts of the U.S. population. In the 1970s, there were about 15 people of older age or after retirement for each working age individual in the U.S. Nowadays, that number is 25 plus. It has been rising significantly over the past 10 years. The U.S. birth rate is also declining, so there will be fewer young Americans to fill the open roles. If we were in a world where we actually want to reallocate resources in the most effective way globally, you know, it's a no-brainer to say, well, the U.S. now needs a lot of young people, and we have them. They, they want to come, and, and it's just really a matter of understanding that it's beneficial for the country. But if we decide to import a larger number of young people to, to do labor to become new Americans, we have to do it in a manner that's, that's legal and that's fair. If we could recruit people who spoke English and had skills and were of working age and healthy, that would be better if we're making a pure economic argument than um, allowing in the elderly, infirm parents of existing American citizens or just whoever shows up at the border. It's a huge opportunity for the United States to blunt some of the effect of fertility decline and population aging by uh, having an immigration policy that may be a bit more focused, not necessarily on just accepting anybody for compassionate reasons, but for bringing in people to, to fill in those skill gaps. There are people who want to come to the U.S. to work. Almost one million temporary foreign work visas were granted in 2022. The reason why the United States is seeing more migration in the last couple of years uh, under this administration in particular is because we have more job openings now than we've had at any point in our entire history. This enormous increase in the amount of demand for workers is driving people uh, to move and uh, seek opportunity here. I don't think I agree with that estimate of there being whatever 9, 12 million unfilled jobs unless we balance it with the number of people who are sitting on the bench, who, in other words, who aren't looking for work anymore. I don't think there's ever been a time when there weren't jobs here if you were willing to undercut local wages. But as people come to the U.S., finding legal work is difficult. Now, immigration policy conversations tend to center around the ability to work. In 1986, Congress banned people working without authorization in the United States. This bill, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986 that I'll sign in a few minutes, is the most comprehensive reform of our immigration laws since 1952. They made it impossible to hire someone who was in the United States illegally or without employment authorization. It traded amnesty for about three million people who were here illegally 
for uh, enforcement in the future. Now they have a system called E-Verified. Any employer, if they're going to hire somebody, uh, just puts in their name and data into a, into a database. It pings off all the, the you know, relative the, the federal holdings um, to, just to make sure that that person is authorized to work. And if the answer is no, then that person can't get a job. That was the deal. It never happened. The amnesty happened, but the work authorization part never went through. It set up this magnet of people being able to come in and work illegally um, and get paid under the table. Um, and, and so it never achieved the purpose that it was supposed to achieve. Immigrants are granted work authorization papers, which are intended to correlate with the employees needed to fill open roles and help the economy grow. There are visas for entrepreneurs. There are visas for people who want to work in professional positions. When those you know, employers can show that there isn't somebody in the United States with the, that same expertise, for example. So this is not about taking American jobs or something like that, right? Major US tech companies like Google, Apple, and Meta use this visa system to fill roles. These jobs require proof of extraordinary ability in the case of O-1 and EB-1A visas. Visas like the HB-1 require at least a bachelor's degree or equivalent, and L-1 visas require the employee to have pre-existing relationships with a company that works in the U.S. and abroad. I take one example. I know we have this H-1B visa, right? The whole idea of that was that it's filling a temporary demand for high-skilled labor uh, with, you know, trained foreigners that Americans can't do. Well, what's supposed to happen if you believe in markets, as I do, and if a market is working properly, an internal market, then you're going to attract people to study those things in college and to take those jobs. But the H-1B, because it always somewhat undercuts uh, the, the prevailing wage, it's never allowed the market to exercise that function where the wages go up and then people are tempted to go into those fields and fill those jobs. The green card system is extremely restrictive in the United States. The vast majority of people come through family ties, and there are very few opportunities for people who are sponsored by employers. The regulatory barriers to sponsoring a foreign worker are uh, monumental. You're talking about a, a process that typically can take between two and three years for a worker to get through. It is uh, effectively off the table to sponsor a worker for a lesser skilled position Maybe you're looking to hire someone who's going to be just an electrician, doesn't require a college degree, but you need some technical skills. That is not something that our immigration system is designed for. Aside from a work visa, the main legal ways immigrants can come to the U.S. are via family-based immigration, student visas, through the diversity visa lottery like Professor Bahar, by seeking asylum or by claiming refugee status. It's very important to note that these pathways have been really narrowed and shut down over, over the years. In 2022, foreign-born workers accounted for 18.1% of the U.S. workforce, up from 17.4% in 2021. While there have been some cases of companies deliberately discriminating against U.S. workers in favor of foreign-born employees, the majority of foreign-born workers actually create more jobs for Americans. Immigrants represent 25% of entrepreneurs of the country. They create firms at a higher rate. They create firms that grow much faster in terms of jobs. And if you look, for instance, at Fortune 500 companies, more than 40% of these companies have been created by immigrants or children of immigrants. The reality is that immigrants who come in do create jobs uh, for Americans, better paying jobs with better benefits. In the meantime, many desks continue to sit idle. U.S. immigration policy is far too restrictive for the economic needs of the United States. We haven't had an update in our legal immigration laws in more than three decades. We're stuck with the same quotas that we had before the invention of the internet. I mean, this is the most important aspect of our immigration laws. The fact that far more people would like to live in the United States legally than are able to do so on an annual basis. The U.S. spends a lot of money housing and caring for migrants. We've seen a lot of efforts from the authorities to keep migrants from coming at a time where you know, this country needs a lot of workers. And also, when they come, to try to keep them from working <laughs> and to try to keep them perhaps in places without work permits in a way that they're actually, their stay is being subsidized by the American taxpayer. 
instead of actually telling them, hey, go and work, find your talent, reach your full potential. If you're coming for economic opportunity, if you want to work and contribute to the United States, you're going to be an asset. And with the increasing perils of climate change, more people are going to be forced to move. Unfortunately, the United States doesn't recognize any, any pathway to live in the United States based on um, climate change or global warming. More than one billion people may be displaced due to climate change by 2050. This could present an opportunity for the U.S. economy, much like Canadian immigration policies have helped its economy grow. Canada is a country that has a system which is very different. It's a system where people with talent can easily find or relatively easily find a legal pathway to reach their full potential there. Well, I'm a Canadian, um, and uh, I should say for your, your audience, our immigration policy here in this country is has elements of compassion to it, but it's really very self-interested and economically driven. With an aging population and a declining birth rate, the only way that you're going to be able to continue to grow your economy is you've got, if you've got people to be consumers, people to be workers, and people to be taxpayers. One could argue that Canada has benefited a lot from the broken migration system in the U.S. I don't believe that in Washington, D.C., there is a consensus about what the purpose of our immigration system should be. And so as soon as we realize migration is never going to stop, then I think we can start to make some intelligent choices about what we do with it then. The first thing I would do is I would secure the border. I would complete uh, a, a physical barrier that made it impossible for people to just swim or walk into the country without having to meet some border official and present their, their case and their demands. Uh, I would reform the legal system to make it easier for people to apply, would not necessarily mean that they would get the benefit. Um, and I would make sure that the needs of uh, labor and the economy were placed above family reunification, not eliminate the latter category, but change the emphasis. Other groups suggest adapting more inclusive policies overall. I argue that the onus should be on the U.S. government to show why people should not be able to cross rather than on people to show why they should be able to. There are many reasons that are, there are many valid reasons why someone might, might want to come and live in the United States. Um, and it should be a simple process, right, to say, I would like to work. Danny Bahar and his colleagues are developing what they're calling the Occupational Opportunity Network to help keep decision makers informed about how migrants can help the U.S. economy grow. And what we're trying to do is to really um, provide to decision makers the numbers that need to be on the table when we're thinking about doing a comprehensive reform of the migration system. By looking at every occupation in every locality in the U.S. and, and projections and historical data were able to actually come up with numbers that are much higher than the current caps in the in the U.S. system. We hope that these numbers are going to be the basis for a comprehensive migration reform. It all starts with people because that's all an economy is. The reality is we need more workers to make up for the declining birth rates in this country. We need not only in the short term to fill these labor shortages, but also in the long term to make sure that we have the workers that we need. So I think the message of trying to see these people as a terrible burden instead of a blessing, because they could bring work and skills that they could act, they're, they're willing to work and they're willing to contribute if they are just given the opportunity, instead of being bounded to a locality or to, you know, to a place without subsidized by the taxpayers, I, that's something that it goes beyond me. I think it's un-American um, and I think this country can do much better than that.